Hey, I'm Julie Rose. Welcome to Love What You Love. I'm an author, creator, and enthusiast, and I've always been fascinated by the things that people are super into because they're always a unique expression of curiosity and joy and wonder. So every week, I'll introduce you to another fascinating human who's into really interesting stuff. So, hey, is 2020 getting you down? Doom scrolling like it's your job, maybe? Are you ready for some extremely wholesome content? Then have I got the guest for you. Rick Justin is a former corporate legal counsel who has traded long days stuck in an office for long walks in nature. A certified master naturalist, he's super passionate about nature. Not just what you see out on long hikes, but the nature in your own backyard, too. We talked way back in April about the epidemic of feeling nature-starved, learning to look more closely, citizen science, and so much more. So find out why Rick loves nature and naturalist programs, and why you might learn to love them, too. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, no problem, Julie. Glad, glad to be here. I'm so excited to talk with you. So your background is in uh, corporate law, and I know you were with, was it Texas Instruments for a very long yeah, time? 30 years. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. And so when you retired, you guys moved out here to California, and you got involved in something called the, it's the UC Naturalist Program. Is that is that the right name? That's right. UC California Naturalist Program. If you could tell me a little bit about that, and just for people who are maybe confused, it doesn't mean that you're a nudist. It yes. means... <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. Uh, no, naturalist in the sense of nature. And uh, actually, I, I retired a few years before we moved out here to California. So I actually first got into the uh, Master Naturalist Program in Texas. And when we moved out here, one of the reasons we moved to California was we love the beauty and the nature, and we thought... You know, it would be great if they had a similar program to learn about California nature. And uh, sure enough, they did. And it's called the UC California Naturalist Program. Okay, so what is what is a master naturalist and what is a naturalist program? Well, the program out here, they're they're pretty similar. All the different chapters are uh, there's different chapters. The sponsoring organization is uh, UC California, University of California. Um, But each uh, chapter is sponsored by what they call their partners. So there may be a little difference between a program, say, here in the Diablo region, which is the one I uh, joined in one that might be in another part of California. But the basic program is uh, 40 hours of classroom education on local nature and uh, three or four field trips in addition to that. Uh, ours also required what they call the capstone project. And, uh, and then afterwards, you're sort of invited and encouraged to volunteer with local organizations to support uh, an understanding of local nature. So what are the kinds of things that you do in this program? Well, the, the, the classroom uh, time, uh, ours was out here in Walnut Creek at the Lindsay Wildlife Experience. And it was a classroom of, say, I think there were about 30 or 40 people in our class. And we met once a week from six to eight at night. And each week would have a different theme. And the goal was over 12 weeks, you're going to know a whole lot about uh, your area's nature. So it'd be uh, ecology might be one week. Birds would be another, mammals, geology, uh, weather, uh, fire and water uh, issues, grazing is one of the ones that we covered. But basically every aspect, botany, so you everything from insects to, to uh, plants and animals. It's a pretty comprehensive study of local nature. And so do you... So you met, you know, for a couple hours, you know, every week. Was this like a hands-on thing? Was it textbook? Was it kind of all of the above? It was mostly presentations. Sometimes we'd have some classroom activities, uh, you know, where they would pass around leaves and we'd do uh, identification using keying, which is how you learn uh, how to differentiate plants by how their leaves are shaped or the branches. Or uh, a water expert might bring in some uh 
uh, water samples and we learn how to test water and learn about the different uh, pollutants and, and aspects of water that he manages. Uh, but each each class would have a different uh, teacher and they would be, some of them would be local professors from uh, nearby colleges. Some would be uh, people that are employed by, say, East, uh, East Bay Regional Parks District or somebody from the Lindsay Wildlife Center about animal rehabilitation. But anybody, you know, different, different people that are really experts in their field and very enthusiastic about their particular slice of nature. And so you said you actually had started this kind of um, program back in Texas. Did you become a master naturalist in Texas as well? I did. That's what I did first. I had a, actually, I was just considering retirement. I had a friend who had gone through the program, which I'd never heard of. And she knew I liked nature because I had uh, been a Boy Scout leader and and I liked, I don't know how she knew, you know, we did a little bit of camping. And so she said, hey, Rick, you're you're curious about nature. Uh, You might like this program. And I was so glad she introduced me to it because I found our local chapter and I started going to the training there. And it really opened up a whole world of uh, activities and volunteering out in Texas. So you so there's chapters. um in each state, sounds like in each, maybe even just broken down even further into regions. Is there like a an overarching organization that looks after this or are they kind of uh, a loose confederation? Uh, at the state level, there is. So there's there's a, probably a couple employees. It's not a uh, it's a highly volunteer oriented, but there's probably a few state employees that run the California Naturalist Program, the California UC California program. And uh, you can find their website. If you were to Google UC California uh, naturalist, you would find their website. They would ex- they would s- explain more about it. And they'd also have a, uh, uh, a map where you could zoom in and find the chapter closest to you and then learn learn uh, about their particular program and how they sponsor it. And so in terms of like, is it usually universities that are sponsoring this? So like in Texas, was it UT that was sponsoring the program? It was uh, Texas A&M and the Texas Parks and Wildlife uh, both sort of co-sponsored it. And uh, yeah, there is there are materials here in California. They had a really nice uh, it's called a handbook. I suppose a member of the public could buy it just as a resource for learning about nature. But it's the California Naturalist Handbook. Texas had its own uh, was it when I first started, it was a giant notebook with a bunch of loose leaf uh, (laughs) chapters added in. And I think they were moving to an online disc. And uh, so, yeah, a lot of detail, but very much. Each section was kind of its own universe. So, the, yeah, I would be a professor of geology that might uh, might describe the the local geology. And that's one of the things that makes it so great is it's highly localized. So it isn't let's learn all about global ecology. It's let's learn about uh, the plants and animals and geology of the specific area that you live in. So beyond just the fact that it's super interesting, it sounds like there's also kind of an ultimate goal of getting people who are in this program to go volunteer uh, in support of your local environment. Yes. In fact, that, that was a, a little clearer and maybe a little stronger uh, uh, mission in the Texas program than the California program. There, I noticed a slight difference between the two. They do have the same reporting of hours that you do as volunteering here. But uh, I noticed in our class, our class was probably uh, – Half the people were uh, 30 and younger. Maybe there were some uh, some small set of people like me that were like older and retirees and looking for new learning and new activities and kind of the rest were sort of in the middle. And a lot of people I noticed were, were taking the course in part to sort of broaden their own credentials as naturalists because they may already have been employed. We had a, a woman that worked at the Oakland Zoo, and we had uh, somebody that was uh, working for the uh, regional parks district that wanted to learn more and become more of a, of a docent for uh, nature tours. And we had people that were working at the Lindsay Wildlife Center doing, uh, you know, raptor rehabilitation for birds that had been hurt and wanted to kind of have a little broader understanding. So it was a wide group of people with a, a, a diversity of interests. For your capstone project, what did you 
you end up doing? Oh, it was fascinating. Wait till you hear. <laughs> um, mine was all about stinkwort. Does that does that sound fascinating? Uh, one of the uh, co-sponsors of our chapter, we had we met at the Lindsay Wildlife uh, Center, but the uh, Cal State East Bay has a satellite campus in Concord, and they had just uh, opened up uh, an area of their pretty large campus out there as a research, uh, e- ecological research station. And so when I was looking for a project, they were looking for people to help them kind of get started understanding the land that they're putting in this. And one of the problems they have there is they have the, a big grazing area, but it was being invaded by this uh, invasive species called stinkwort, which turns out to be a big problem in all of the Bay Area. Uh, and, and growing problem. And it's kind of taking over a lot of grazing area. It's taking over a lot of open fields. And they wanted to know more about it. So I did my research project on that. So it's kind of like the kudzu of California. Very much. Yeah, exactly. It is. Uh, sadly, it is kind of a kudzu type thing. It really, once it takes over, uh, you wouldn't notice it now. It really, it sort of a, is a low growing plant until about J- July and August. And then it shoots up and forms these like little Christmas tree weeds with little yellow flowers, yellow, yellowish white flowers on it. And once you know how to recognize it, you'll start seeing it everywhere. And it, it really likes disturbed spaces along roads. And uh, you'll be seeing more and more of it uh, over coming years, unfortunately. And so when you were in Texas, what was your capstone project? Well, there we didn't have the same thing. We didn't have the, a capstone project, so I can't really speak to that. We had uh, volunteer requirements, and uh, mine was I really like – I'm kind of a generalist. You know, it's interesting. You say nature, and the, everybody goes through the same course, but people will focus on – usually hone in on something they really love. Like you already have the birders, and they love the birds. We had one woman that loved uh, dragonflies, and she got involved in – there's actually a citizen science project where you observe observe and catalog and report on on dragonflies migrations uh, there is, most people have heard about monarchs and the monarchs so there's there were people that were into moths and butterflies and did a lot of work with monarchs but i was kind of a generalist what i like to do is just kind of learn i liked it when I, an expert would give us an aha moment and tell you something really interesting And then uh, what I did is I volunteered to lead uh, nature hikes, mostly for kids, but also for adults. And you would just walk through a nature area and point out interesting stuff and tell a little story about it. And that was that became kind of my thing. I love that. That sounds like a lot of fun, actually. It was it was really fun. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So now have you. You say you were a generalist. So have you always loved nature? Are you just kind of interested in everything around you? Like what compelled you to kind of get into this program? Unfortunately, when you uh, spend 30 years in uh, an office pushing paper and dealing with legal issues, (laughs) you don't get a whole lot of time for nature in your life. And I think a lot of us get to be sort of nature starved. And uh, the feeling and enjoyment you get out of being outside in beautiful area is something I think a lot of people can relate to. And it certainly meant a lot to me. One of the things I really got out of this program was just such a, a deeper appreciation of nature. Here in the Bay Area, it's so charismatically beautiful on sort of a superficial level that I think people spend a lot of time in nature, but they may not appreciate it at the level that they could. And when I would lead groups, I would often say that if you take a toddler out and you point at a tree, they'll call it a tree and they know what a bush is and they know what a gra- what grass is. But it, most adults sort of stop learning it at that level. They know mm. what trees are and they know what grass is, but there's so much more they could they could appreciate if they really understood what they were looking at. So, you know, people are busy and, you know, things, you know, they have other things that they're focusing on. Why would why does it matter if someone knows if a tree is an elm or an oak? Well, so much of it. I mean, that's part of it. And there are people that and I'm partially one of them, but there are people that really like knowing that it's an oak or Mm -hmm. knowing that it's an elm. But I think it's more than just learning how learning a, a deeper catalog it's kind of understanding, like a lot of people, I'll give you a good example that everybody with a house can relate to is that you, everyone's heard of invasive plants or native plants, and maybe it's better to plant native, and, but they don't really understand why. And when you understand the ecology of nature, 
you understand that if you plant a, uh, what's a good example, something like a crepe myrtle, uh, a crepe myrtle plant is is kind of like a silk silk plant. It, it's alive and it's beautiful and it's decorative, but there are very few insects that can eat it. And if there are no insects that can eat it, there's no food for birds. And uh, so you're going to have a, a major decrease in the richness and diversity of, of the entire ecosystem if you don't have plants that are that your native uh plants and animals and birds and mammals have evolved to be able to exploit. So people need to understand that when they when they pick uh, non plants, they're really degrading the quality of the environment. But if you plant, say, an oak tree, oak is a great example. It's not only one of our most common trees here, but it's there are so many things that live. The, the, if you were and there are studies of this, if you were to basically count the insects that exploit the oak and then all the birds and mammals that live off those insects, uh, it might be a hundred times what say a ginkgo tree would support, or maybe even a thousand times in the, in the case of a ginkgo. So no, understanding that also makes you appreciate that even the choices you're making in your yard can have a lot, can have a big impact on uh, the quality of our, our natural environment. In terms of, the kinds of people, so you said that there were um, folks who were already naturalists or um, just folks who were uh, retired and interested. Is there kind of a, was there a theme between the kinds of folks who do this um, that you notice between Texas and here? You know, I think there might be, uh, I think people spend more time outside here just because the climate is so conducive to it. I mean, in Texas, you go from well, three or four months a year, it's just so hot, you don't even want to go outside. <laughs> and then uh, you have why, you know, here you can pretty much count on being outside almost every day and enjoying yourself in the beauty. So I think you've got a lot more, uh, a lot more interest in being in the outdoors. And I think also there is a culture here that is uh, more ecologically attuned. And so that sort of sets people up to uh, want to know more. But I, I, in, in truth, I think most people, it's kind of sad because most of the of the education of nature we have are for for kids, right? I mean, you might go on a field trip or you might, if you're a scout, you have a requirement. And I would lead groups that sometimes of kids and the parents would be tagging along. And it would be interesting to me to notice how fascinated the parents were. Hmm. And it sort of taught me that there was a, a hunger for a little more information about their surroundings that was out there in the people, in the adults, than I think was being met. And I kind of see that here too. I mean, you have a lot, a lot of people that use the trails, but they use it for recreation, for exercise, but they may not know any more than those toddlers about the nature that surrounds them. And, and I think there's, uh, you know, a lot of people that would find it fascinating to know more about it. When you were doing this program, e either in Texas or, or in California, was that some, was there something that really, really surprised you, either about the area, about the ecology, about yourself? Like, was there anything that was like, wow, this is a real aha moment? Uh, guys, there were several of those, really. One, one in particular, there's a phrase everybody's heard called biodiversity. And you sort of think you know what it means. But when you have an expert that sort of opens your eyes up to it, it's very interesting. And I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the sad things in most of the places we live, and it's, it's about as true here as it was in Texas, despite the beauty here, so much of our local environment is non-native invasive species that and a lot of land that's been degraded over my, what might have once been sort of the virgin wilderness uh, ecosystem and in texas that seemed very obvious you know it used to be the the great plains and the prairies and the buffalo and now it's just tract homes and subdivisions and we had a local uh park that had uh, a field and it looked very beautiful to me i mean it had beautiful grasses and trees along the creek and and uh, the expert took us out there and he took like a, a, a little thing, a, a sort of a square hula hoop type size thing. And he put it down on the ground. And he said, well, let's crouch down 
and start counting out the different species within this square meter. And he, of course, was better at it than we were, but I'd say he could maybe identify 10 to 15 species, which seemed like a lot to us. On a field trip a week later, uh, we took a field trip to a place called Climber Meadows, which is this untouched uh, uh, tall grass prairie in Texas, several thousand acres, very rare posted, well, it's bigger than a postage stamp, but very rare, rare fragment of untouched prairie. And we did the same thing. And there were about 200 species. Oh, wow. And it wasn't just grass. It was like, it was, it looked like the Garden of Eden. I mean, it was spring. So there were so many different types of plants and flowers and grasses all crammed into this one little area. I guess I naively thought that if you, you know, sort of fenced off an area of grass back in in the in the park that I'd been in and left it alone, it would turn itself back into that. But it doesn't. It was kind of sad. You know, the recovery of degraded ecosystems is a difficult challenge. And it doesn't even happen naturally if you just leave it untouched because of the science. Tell tell yeah. me more. Yeah, tell me more about that. Why why wouldn't it be well, uh, one back. example, part of it is the science that we're still coming to understand. But one ex- example of th- is this, that uh, part of what supported that ecosystem was was fungus and microbes in the soil. So there's a whole diverse ecosystem in the soil. And once you have plowed that land up and exposed it to the air, you've actually killed off a lot of the species, microscopic species that were necessary to support the diversity of the ecosystem. And you don't reintroduce those by coming along with a native grass plug and sticking it in and watering it and thinking it's going to grow because you've basically changed the whole chemistry and, uh, you know, ecosystem function of that remnant. Uh, So that if you have, you know, if you have land that's been plowed in a farm and you let it go back to a prairie, it won't be the same prairie, at least not in tens or hundreds of years. It may eventually get there just as all evolution does. And I found that to be fascinating. The aha moment was just the being able to see with my eyes how much more diverse the native area was, but also sort of understanding kind of how man's impact is more lasting and difficult to fix than than you might think. Are there nonprofits that work specifically on that kind of thing, uh, biodiversity and, and, you know, recovery or protection? Yeah, there are, and I see a lot of them here. I, I'm not involved with them it, it yet, or, or at this point, there are different land trusts that do, and, and organizations do restoration. It's it's hard work. It's uh, very labor intensive, and therefore very expensive to do it well. And kind of also another interesting thing is is some of it is is sort of new science, and there's a lot of trial and error going on. Uh, some of the universities are doing, you know, pilot projects to see, well, how do we bring back a marshland and how do we restore uh, a a grassland area? And uh, like kind of the example I gave you about the the fungus in the in the microorganisms in the soil is an example of something that wasn't really very well understood until pretty recently. So that's actually kind of exciting. There's a lot of opportunities for young scientists, but whether or not there's a lot of Funding for that is a different story, but it's also an opportunity for volunteers because some of it is, you know, some of it is done with kids with their little seedlings and the, you know, people that go out in in, on the peninsula, particularly uh, there have been some aggressive volunteer stink wart removal efforts and people go out there with their with their gloves and their uh, bags and just go after it and pull it up by hand. So are there things that people can do? around their own home or in their neighborhoods that, you know, like planting native, native plants. Well, planting, yeah. Planting natives is a great, ex- is a great example. There's a guy I'd recommend to you and your listeners called Doug Tallamy, T-A-L-L-A-M-Y. He's got a book or two out on the subject, uh, but actually he gives a great uh, PowerPoint kind of lecture all over the country. So if you went to YouTube and just look for a YouTube video of one of his lectures, that's almost as fun. I've read his book too, and his book is good, but uh, uh, an hour long uh, lecture would really teach you so much about why it's important to plant uh, 
native plants in your yard. And that's and, and, and really how impactful that could be to our environment. And I can't even do it justice, but I, I recommend that. And then as far as, you know, in your local, uh, while you're enjoying nature, uh, one thing I've noticed is that if you, once you plug into the right uh, Facebook pages or websites or get newsletters, there's a lot of uh, docented, meaning expert-led uh, nature activities, and that's a great opportunity to go out and learn some more. Being a naturalist, getting you know certified in the program, has it branched off into other interests that you didn't anticipate? Well, one that was a pretty big deal for me back in Texas, and then and it has to do with something unique to the region. But uh, one of the activities we did as a field trip was to head out to uh, a uh, publicly open uh, riverbed, which was rich with fossils. And we went fossil hunting. (gasps) And I had never been fossil hunting, and I didn't really know anything about it. And it turns out to be a lot of fun. And uh, it, it was particularly fun there because you would definitely find some. I mean, like anything else, it takes a little while to train your eyes to know what to look for. And they helped us with that. But uh, it really opened up a whole separate interest that I got into. And I even joined, they had an organization called the Dallas Paleontological Association. And uh, which was, which was a fun group because it was uh, everybody from professors at the local universities, some of whom were sort of world renowned paleontologists (laughs) and uh, kids who were among the best hunters. And I mean, <laughs> it was basically open to anyone and uh, they would have a monthly meeting and a lecture, but they'd also have, and what, what made it particularly worth joining is they would have field trips that would take you to private land where you were allowed to hunt. Because normally you're not supposed to uh, disturb nature, including fossils on any public land. And that's true here in California as well. So uh, finding places where there's an, it's still fun to go look for fossils, which anyone can do, uh, but uh, it's even better when you have uh, permission to collect and uh, because it's just fun to have some that you found yourself and take them home and put them on a shelf. Yeah, for sure. Now, what kind of fossils did you find there and have you found any here? I have seen some here. It's there. It's uh, the geology here is very complicated compared to Texas. Texas is a classic layer cake, (laughs) or at least where I lived. You know, it's the old stuff on the bottom and then a layer on top of that and a layer on top of that. So when you had a creek or something, you would it would open up the deeper layers and creeks sort of naturally expose fossils fossils. And the fossils there were all Cretaceous era, which is like 65 to 90 million years ago, marine fossils because of the, it used to be underwater in the inland sea. So we would find a lot of uh, shells, oysters and clams and and mussels, but also ammonites, uh, things that are that are now extinct. And uh, some of the most exciting, and I have actually found a vertebrae of one on my first hunt, so maybe that hooked me, but uh, the vertebrae of mosasaurs, which were these giant uh, sort of, uh, they're, they're sort of the T-Rex of the oceans, these giant uh, reptiles that would uh, feed on sharks. Some of them would be bigger than a bus, uh, and uh, they would have their, you could still find their teeth and their, and their uh, some of their bones, especially their vertebrae, if you know what you're looking for. So that was fun. That sounds incredible. (laughs) It was really fun. Now here, uh, there are areas, well, Shell Ridge is so named in in, uh, Walnut Creek area on the slopes of Mount Diablo because it's also got some of those, I think they're Cretaceous era fossils. So you would find shells for sure. Uh, And then there are newer uh, fossils that are found in this area, including things like uh, mammoth bones and uh, some of the some of the giant uh, creatures that are more recent but also extinct like giant sloths and saber-toothed tigers and the things that uh, would excite kids those are not easy to find but it's fun to read that they have found some in in the bay area even if a listener wanted to get involved in a naturalist program or just kind of getting more um thoughtful about what they're seeing and what they're looking for every time they go out and for a walk like how would you recommend they get started i think having an enthusiastic interpreter out in the field take you on a walk and and show you things is by far the most fun 
uh, Bay Nature magazine would alert you to some. I know in Mount Tam in the area of Marin, they have a, an association where they have lots of hikes. So when those all open up again, those would be a great thing to do. And presumably, I mean, there's analogous organizations and uh, publications everywhere in the world. Everywhere. Once you start looking, and uh, that's the beauty of things like Facebook, if you like a page on one, it'll suggest others or <laughs> events in your area. And sometimes even cities and counties will will sponsor such things. And I would say definitely go on those and then maybe ask about others when you're there. There may be uh, newsletters or or bulletin boards or something that would would tell you things that you would have otherwise missed. Now there's, I hope I'm getting this right, there's a program or and or a website called iNaturalist. Is that right? Ah, yeah. Well, it's, it's funny you should mention that because uh, it just actually starts tomorrow. But iNaturalist is a great uh a great exploring tool. And it's also citizen science. So I'd recommend everyone check this out. And I would, I would, I would go to the website first and just uh, type in I naturalist, I like little I naturalist, one word, and it'll, it'll get you to uh, their homepage and sign up there and then download the app to your smartphone. And what that does is it, that app will do is it will uh, turn the camera in your smartphone into a nature observing tool. So you can go up to basically anything that you can get a good, clear picture of, whether it be a flower or a tree leaf or a bug, or if you're good at catching a bird before it flies away, a bird or a butterfly. If you get a good, clear picture of it, hit uh, upload, and uh, iNaturalist will use the information in your camera to sort of know where you are. If you permit it, you can control the settings, but uh, assuming you've permitted it to know everything about where you're taking pictures, and it will suggest to you yeah, what it thinks you're looking at. And uh, sometimes it might give you four or five things or, or the top 10 things that this might be. So it'll say this looks it's definitely a bird. You knew that. But it looks like it might be a Stellar's J. And then you can look at the picture of the Stellar's J that it gives you compared to what you saw. And you can even click on a little thing that would tell you all about Stellar's J's. And once you think you know that's what it is, you just hit upload and it will upload that to a database that other naturalists, many of them just amateur naturalists, will look at and then they can help verify or correct what you've seen. And then that becomes a database once it becomes research grade, which means others have agreed that you've got a, a good identification. Scientists are actually using that database now to look at things like what's the range of species and when are they most often seen and when did they first appear? And is climate change showing that certain birds are moving further north than they it used to be reported? So it's it's a it's a lot of fun to just learn about nature, but you're also helping scientists sort of catalog the nature in your area. And it doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to be up in the mountains on a on a hike. You can just be walking around your neighborhood or in your backyard. No, you can do it in your own backyard. Now, they prefer you to do wild things, although you can use it. It's actually pretty. If there was a pretty flower in your neighbor's yard and you wondered what that plant was, it would probably tell you and you could go to the nursery and ask for it. So that's kind of fun. But the, from a science standpoint, they're looking for wild nature. And uh, yeah, even if you had a spider crawling across your wall in the house before you smush it, <laughs> if you're going to, you could take a picture of it and learn more about it. So it's, it's a lot of fun. There's actually a big, uh, it used to be a contest this year because of uh, the coronavirus. They're going to play down the, the contest aspect, but there's a four day period where different cities all around the world are going to be, people will be using that tool to see who can find the most different species and how many, how many observations can each city make. It's a lot of fun. I'm going to go download that right now as soon as we're done talking. It starts, it starts tomorrow. So, yeah, download that, play with it, and and, uh, and, it's, and it's every year. So if you miss it this year, you could play with the tool, and then by next year you could help uh, the Bay Area. If you're in the Bay Area, that will help you win the contest. But uh, there are cities all over all over the world now. Last year, uh, Cape Town, South Africa came in number one. Wow. Awesome. Well, this has been uh, so enlightening and so much fun. And um, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. Well, thank you. I love sharing the, the love of nature. And I hope everybody found something interesting and new to go learn, learn about or, or get outside and enjoy. 
If you'd like to learn more about the nature around you, even in your own backyard, check out the iNaturalist app. I'll post links to that in the show notes, along with links to the Master Naturalist programs you can find around the U.S. Also, I've included links to Rick's favorite nonprofits and some of mine, too. Now, if you go out for a hike, socially distanced, of course, take some pictures and tag me on Instagram at lovewhatyoulovepod or on Twitter at whatyoulovepod so I can share the happy with everyone else. If you'd like to support the podcast, leaving a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, even if that's not where you listen, is a great way to do that. You can also spread the love and share about the podcast on social media. Thank you to everyone who has rated, reviewed, or socialed already. Zeke Rodriguez Thomas at MindJam Media provided amazing editing assistance. You can find Zeke at mindjammedia.com. Also, huge thanks to Emily White, as always, for the episode transcripts, which are available to patrons at patreon.com slash lovewhatyoulovepod. And if you've been listening for a while now, you know what I'm going to say. Please be good to yourselves and each other and love the hell out of whatever it is that you love. Thanks for listening. Let's hang out again soon. There's some good in this world, Mr. Furl, and it's worth fighting for.